Hi everybody, Dr. Friedman here. And it's a short week for Campaign Diaries this week because our fall break is Thursday and Friday. So to get us started with break a little bit early, um, I decided that this would be one of our play testing days. Um, and so in this video, I'm gonna talk about Avery Alder's The Quiet Year which ended in this foam core board that you see behind me. I love this game for a variety of reasons. Um, it's a map game. It is a GMless game. Um, as the Shut Up and Sit Down review uh, that I'll post in the comments below notes, it's also a game that in theory can be played as a solo game, which is wonderful for students who can't always find other people to play with. It's based on a 52 card deck and so the rules also have the ability to play with just a standard deck of playing cards or as we did you can play on roll 20. And so we did a little bit of a hybrid experience. This is a game that's normally designed for four to five players. We have four to five tables in our room. And so a lot of the initial startup we did table by table. Uh, so we, uh, the setup was we've got this giant foam core board um, in the middle of the room with some markers. Um, our monitors all had the same display that I created on roll 20, which had the, here's what you do on a turn. Here's a place for us to talk about Scylla's projects. And here are the places for scarcities and abundances. And I could draw cards from there. Um, so what we did for the things that require four to five items, like, like our resources and like the initial starting features, is I had each table take about 30 seconds to a minute to decide on one feature per table and one resource per table. Um, it got weird almost immediately um, because uh, we had some interesting notions about what a uh, interesting resource is. Um, and so um, in our case, we started out with um, diamonds, fur, salmon, and uh, shelter um, were our resources of which we had fur in abundance. Um, by the end, we had abundances in fire and salmon and had added the scarcities of trust and health and fertility. Um, this despite a large number of projects completed. Um, so the way that mechanically uh, we actually took the 52 week turns is um, I kept an eye on the clock. Um, you Roll 20 makes it difficult to remove the number of cards that are recommended for a short game. So I just kept an eye on the clock and had a sense of when we needed to proceed to another season in order to have the game finish by the end of the 75 minutes um, or have any hope of ending at the 75 minutes. I had in my head that if the timer for five minute end of class went off, before I'd pull the Frost Shepherd's card that ends the game officially, we would just say that was a functionally the Frost Shepherd's card. But I did want to get through all of the different seasons for the, the flavor. And so um, we once we had drawn the resources and the initial features, we went student by student uh, through the room, pulling cards and having them respond. Um, and that was really interesting and fun. I will say in a 75 minute class, every student had the chance to go twice, um, at least. In part, that was because I messed up for a while. Um, for a while, we were drawing cards and having students react um, without offering or reminding students of the actions, which are discover something new, hold a discussion or start a project. The good news was I caught the error early enough so that, and there were enough projects that were being started based on the cards that, you know, we weren't behind in terms of planning or, or anything like that. And I think we still had a robust um, experience. We might not have gotten to everyone twice if we had required everyone 
uh, to do an action on their week's turn. Um, so I don't know how that would have gone mechanically. It would have been a little bit different in terms of um, hard choices around projects because I think we would have had, of course, a lot more projects. Our map was still really full of interesting detail, so we didn't lack for that. Um, so, but it was an interesting learning experience for students. In my summing up comments, I said, hey, I messed up the rules. We still told an interesting story together. We still had fun. I was able to, we were able to recover. And I think that's something that's an important takeaway from this experience is a lot of our recent discussion has been anxiety around getting rules right. And that's not necessary as long as everyone at the table has a sense of goodwill and, um, you know, fellow feeling and wanting to, you know, execute this well or in an enjoyable way. In retrospect, um, while I had basically everything virtual, so like the projects were kept track of on our little Roll20 notepad, um, as opposed to removing counters, I do wish that I had created physical objects for the contempt tokens, which I kind of hand waved because when I play the game, contempt didn't really come into the uh, kind of narrative very much. But this time, some swingy actions were taken that led to some contempt. And that's not a bad thing. Um, the whole goal of the quiet year as a game is to replicate the messy ways that communities come together in these kinds of challenging times and times of uh, scarcity as well as hostility to figure out how to move forward. Um, this is when I tell you that the pandemic also impacted this game. I had forgotten that this game includes multiple cards that talk about infection or contagious people. I don't know whether we would have pulled them out had I remembered, um, and if they were, if I was working from a physical deck, um, because I think it was interesting. Uh, to have the decision. I did give students who got those cards the ability to X them out. Um, and there were other choices on most of the cards, um, but was interesting that um, the first student to pull a pandemic related card, which was all about, you know, kind of, are you going to let a project fail or are you going to let health and fertility become one of the scarcities and they chose that health and fertility was going to become one of the scarcities but they also chose to discover something new and have that be a vaccine and this is a gmless game but i when a student asked later on are we back to not worrying about our health i was like well as we know in the real world vaccines are one part of the of the puzzle and also this game's mechanics are all about um, not letting conflict or uh, it's it's antithetical to the spirit of the game to have an issue come up and immediately be resolved um, in that kind of way. So let's let it ride. And in fact, we didn't get around to completely resolving um, both issues around health and fertility, but also issues around shelter. We barely squeaked in, and that was after the project had been canceled a couple of times, the ability to build shelters at all, um, which is fascinating for me. I've played this game before, and that also happened in a game, in, in a game experience that I had played where we just really didn't think about, like, you know, our, where are we sleeping? Um, even though we'd drawn cards to kind of think about that. And, uh, you know, and this is a game that gets messy really quickly um, because it leaves with to so many unanswered questions. Why were diamonds important to this community? Um, why were why was fur important to this community? Um, why were we initially scarce in salmon, even though we've got you know all these weird salmon runs? And those are the kinds of things that you can build on in a use of the quiet year as kind of a setting engine and. Uh, as I'll talk to my students about, uh, 
the quiet year has been used in that way, most probably visibly by the Adventure Zone for their current campaign, Ether Sea. They spent about five episodes playing the quiet year to create the world in which they would ultimately play Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and students who took a look at the rules on Perusal kind of grokked that almost immediately, the idea that this is a kind of interesting world building exercise if you're kind of at a loss, which I think is a really interesting use for this. Um, but because we ended just about bang on time, the Frost Shepherds came about five minutes before class ended, I decided instead that it was more important to point to the reasons why I like teaching this game, the reason why I think this game is interesting. And I've said this on Twitter as well. What I really enjoy about this game is that this game was not the end piece, um, that Avery Alder, on further reflection and meditation, really kind of thought about the ways in which this game is like many games, part of the kind of colonial mindset, the colonists kind of project. And so the quiet year has the companion game of uh, the dark forest, which um, reimagines the quiet year um, in uh, co-development with Mark D.S. Truman, um, focusing on monstrosity and decolonization. And it takes the perspective of monsters who have retreated um, into the, the deep forest where invading humans are not able to penetrate, um, but that it's one quiet year before they are likely to return. Um, instead, it's come winter, a band of heroes will arrive and we might not survive the encounter. Um, but for now, it's about, quote, healing and self-discovery away from human eyes, which I think is really lovely. Um, and so I, I gestured to that as a companion game for students to pursue and also something that I think is really, you know, ideas worth thinking about. The other thing that I pointed students to is Microscope, a game that I've been playing off and on with one of my groups for quite some time. It can be played physically with index cards, but there's also an online instantiation um, for um, organizing the cards uh, kind of always on. I was able to pull up uh, it for a screenshot earlier today, even though we haven't played in months, and it's still all there, this kind of bonkers world. And it's if the deep forest and the quiet year are map building games, um, we can think of games like Microscope as timeline building games, thinking about chronology um, and the ways that eras have events within them and those events then inspire scenes of brief role play to illuminate the world. But both of these are games that are not character centered. And I think that's really useful to bring up. And in fact, um, I think I'll bring this game up far earlier in the next version of this class, because it does break open the idea that role playing doesn't have to be about a one person having one role and, you know, kind of running with it, you know, that it doesn't have to be about character creation and character maximization. But as the instructions to the quiet, you're focus you on is that kind of bird's eye view, that higher order thinking about how communities work rather than individual psychology. And I think that's a really useful thing to have in our toolkit. Um, I mean, even now, uh, even here at mid-semester, I think it's still really useful, but I think it might be even more useful early on. And of course, this is when I, to my sheepish chagrin, uh, note that when I was talking to Evan Turner, who will be our next guest after fall break uh, to come and talk to us about the kind of long history of uh, tabletop role playing, its communities, and its scholarly publications. And I was like, oh yeah, For the Queen, you know, it's an adaptation of The Quiet Year. And I was like, how did I not know this? Today I learned. Um, and so I think that my new first week activity is very likely to be the quiet year in and, and then move to um, for the queen to uh, you know kind of get the I get both group cohesion happening but also those kinds of individual experiences um, and really interesting to think about the ways in which those mechanics are similar and different and have um, both similar and different kinds of play experiences. 
So yeah, that's the quiet year and how I ran it for 20 to 25 students. If you have more questions, of course, you can put them down into the comment section below, or you can tweet at me at Freed, F-R-I-E-D-E. -E. It's going to be quiet the rest of the week because it's not a quiet year, but it is a quiet week. Um, this is the part of the semester where because it is a contract graded course, I need to check in with my students, all of them before October 15th, so that we all have a sense of how we're going to end strong for the semester. As a general rule, uh, students who talk to me early are also probably the ones who have their ducks in a row. And so, so far, um, we're in good shape. But n knowing that there may be students who are behind in different kinds of ways and needing to catch up, this is the chance that we're going to have, you know, in 15 to 20 minutes uh, to strategize. You know, what ambitious plan did you have when you created the contract? How do we need to revise it? Um, for many students, the un-essay was a kind of amorphous blob. And so now we're going to start talking about, okay, so you've got more under your belt. What are you thinking now? And we've got some cool ideas that are coming down the pike, some of which will be publicly shared with all of you, and some of which will stay here in our own community. Um, and so we'll see. But that's what's on deck for the next little while over here um, in this course. Um, coming up soon uh, is thinking about uh, the structure of how to talk about research with students. And uh, one more guest, um, actually, I shouldn't say one more guest. We've got more guests coming. Uh, London Carlisle will be coming as our kind of spooky Halloween visitor at the end of the month. Um, London Carlisle was my former student, and we worked together on a production here of Frankenstein in honor of the bicentennial of the composition anniversary in 2016. Um, I love London uh, as an actor, but what's fascinating to me is that during the pandemic, he's a working actor. He's a working stage actor based in New York and in Atlanta. And so he's down here in Atlanta. He may be our first in-person guest um, to come and talk about his work, um, streaming and adapting and thinking about um, kind of the spookier elements. Uh, he uh, regularly DMs on Twitch uh, for things like Stream of Blood and for Satine Phoenix's Gilding Light channels. And uh, his home turf is thinking about the supernatural and the spooky, uh, be it D&D's Ravenloft or, which will be our conversation for that week, um, Call of Cthulhu and what it is like to think about Lovecraft in uh, the year of our Lord 2021, um, both through the lens of Talos and Jaffe's uh, Shadow of the Crystal Palace, which is one of my favorite one shots for thinking about how to use historical material, but also what it's like to be a person of color dealing with, um, you know, the long shadow of Lovecraftian racism um, and how that you know, plays into how we play with Cthulhu um, and the Lovecraftian mythos. So lots more to come in the weeks ahead, much more to look forward to, and still so many mysteries as our final weeks will be lab weeks uh, where students get to work together. Uh, in terms of this channel, I will be talking not necessarily about student projects, but how I use those weeks that are largely unstructured, but that have the spirit of improv, which seems appropriate, especially for this semester. So that's me. I'm going to go to student meetings now. Have a great rest of your week.